So, uh, little known thing, I turned, uh, well, not little known in my world, I tried to let everyone know, I turned 51 on Wednesday, so, uh, so I had my birthday celebration about the same time Church One has theirs, and you know, it's interesting, kind of like, you kind of get this mindset when it comes to your birthday, what did you get, you know? Uh, but it's really interesting when it comes to God and when it comes to God marking things, it's less about what you get and more about what did you give. Um, and that, that plays right into right the heart of God. We know that God so loved the world that he gave his only son. In 1 Thessalonians, um, Paul, when he's talking about his service to the church and watching the church grow, he says, you know, we didn't, we didn't just stand back from afar, but we gave our very lives to you. And so when we celebrate here as a church and as a community that God has blessed us with five years, I think the first thing I want to, I mean, there's so much that I have gotten out of it, but what I want to say to you is thank you for giving. Because if it wasn't for your giving financially, your giving of your time and just showing up, your giving of your energy, your prayers, your inviting people, your serving, your setting up, your taking down, working with our children, doing outreach, um, doing all the different groups that we've been a part of, we would never be where we are right now. Um, we're meant to give. That's really the way it's supposed to be. And I, one of the things I always uh, find people asking a lot about in life is, how do I find my gifts? How do I find my calling, my gifts? Well, you know, there's a really simple way you find your gifts. You find your gifts by giving. And church is a community that basically exists because we all get together to give our lives away. Without that, without receiving the life that Christ has given us freely and without us freely giving, none of this happens. And so thank you for giving. Thank you for making this a place that has a heart of giving our lives to Christ. And one of the people in our community who I think really understands this and embodies this, well, really two of the people are Will and Janice Cox. Will and his, yep, give it up. So uh, Will and his wife Janice, this is their third year here in Baltimore. They came to work for a ministry called Young Life. They have two boys, Jake and Griff. Um, you haven't seen Griff much because we had the unfortunate thing of having church during his nap time. But I've noticed that Griff is making a come, make, has given up his nap, I guess, or whatever. But Griff has been around the last few weeks. Um, but, but Will and Janice are a part of Young Life. Like I said, a ministry to middle school, high school, and college kids in this community. And it really embodies the spirit of giving your life away. And um, that's what Will and Janice do. And they have had an impact both inside and outside our body. Um, you know, as much as I would love to think that you college kids are here because I am so hip and our teaching team is so cool, uh, I kind of sense there's another reason, and I think um, one of those reasons is Will and Janice. And so I've asked Will to come and speak on, our, uh, on this moment, and so Will is going to come up. So come on up, Will Cox. Uh, but I want to share this morning about... Uh, that God knows us completely and loves us unconditionally. And so um, let me pray for us. Father, thank you for this morning, and thank you for this family of believers, and that it already has felt like such a celebration. So, Father, I do pray that I would decrease and that you would increase and that you would meet people exactly how they need to be met this morning. In your son's name, amen. So uh, I am the area director for Young Life in, in Baltimore County, and uh, we just recently had our Young Life banquet um, that Mike came to, and I shared a little bit of my uh, story as you know at our banquet. And um, when we were discussing what I would share this morning, he said, "Hey, you know, would you be willing to include some of that uh, with the message that you give?" And I was like, "Absolutely." So if you have seen this picture, I apologize, but I'm going to show you a picture of myself. Uh, that's, that's me in the yellow, okay? <laughs> well, that's not the best lighting. All right, but uh, uh, all right, so you'll notice a few things right off the bat, okay, if you look at that. Number one, my natural highlights, all right? <laughs> Full swing. That's not intentional. That's just how God made me. I'm not mad at him. And I do think that uh, they'd come back if, I, if my hair grew, you know, but it um, doesn't. 
Uh, so that's something you'll notice right off the bat. The other thing that you'll notice that I like to poke fun at is that I'm doing something called the front tuck, which is when you tuck in the front of your shirt but not the rest of your shirt. And it's just to communicate like, hey, I'm, I care about how I look but not too much. You know what I mean? Like, I'm cool. I got swag. Okay. Uh, so here's the other thing, all right? So that, my mom's taking the picture, um, and that's my brother, my sister, my dad. And... Um, and my first car, that white Saturn. I love that car. Uh, here's what you won't know or wouldn't know uh, unless I told you about this, okay, is that at that time in my life, my, my brother and my sister were both really into partying, were both pretty heavily into drinking and drugs, um, and uh, my dad was also an alcoholic and was pretty short-tempered, pretty, it could be an angry guy. And uh, the combination of those things uh, could make my house a scary place to be. And I, at the time, was really involved with Young Life. And I was making a lot of, I feel like, better decisions than my brother and my sister. But honestly, it wasn't so that I would be, I, I wasn't doing it to be a good guy. I think that I was just trying to avoid my dad's temper. And so I was doing things differently. Um, but my Young Life leader was not only my leader, he was my friend, he was also my neighbor. He lived two doors down from me. Um, and so, and uh, you, you can take that picture down because it's just distracting. Uh, <laughs> highlights, you know. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, and I, I think of one time in particular, like because when my, my house would get kind of crazy, I would just leave the house and I'd go hang out with my young life leader. His name was Tim. And um, I don't think he knew that's why I was going there, but it was. And there was one night in particular, it was that year, um, and things were just kind of getting crazy in my house and my dad was really screaming at my mom and it was the first time that I can really remember standing up to my dad and just saying like, hey, enough's enough. And things escalated to the point where we were toe to toe and I, th I thought we were gonna fight. And I'm standing up all strong and tough, 17 year old, you know, and then I just said, forget this. And I walked out and then I just fell apart. You know, and I'm walking down the road just just crying, and um, where do I go? I go to Tim's house, <clears throat> and I tell Tim what happened, and through tears, and I, I probably wasn't even making much sense, but uh, at the end of it, when I finally kind of settled down, he just sat there, he just listened, and he asked me three questions, and I'll never forget them. Uh, the, the first one, he said, well, did your dad hit you? I said, no, no, my dad didn't hit me. He said, did your dad hit your mom? And I said, no my dad didn't hit my mom. And he goes, okay, do you want to watch Sports Center?" <laughs> I said, yes. You know, I was, actually, I probably said, uh-huh. You know, like, <laughs> I, I was like, yeah, you know. And so we sat there and watched Sports Center and then I went home. And um, I'll never forget that because that's, that's largely why I do what I do. Um, I fell in love with Young Life and it wasn't it wasn't because of the camps. We go to some phenomenal camps. We have some really fun games and clubs. And it's like, if you know anything about Young Life, you've seen pictures of wild and crazy fun, probably. I fell in love with the mission of Young Life because of my relationship with my Young Life leader. <clears throat> and I feel like that's why these group of folks are so significant. And I also want to say to you all, I've, I've been doing this for a little while now. And never in my life have I been a part of a church that so intentionally wants to honor you as college students, not even just young life leaders. So I hope you know, I just want you to, you guys hear from me all the time, but that is a gift. And I want to say that uh, in front of everybody, just because I think it's pretty amazing. Um, anyway, I, I feel like that night, for me to be able to tell Tim my story and let him in on not only the hardest, but probably the most embarrassing part of my life, a part that nobody really knew. Um, and for him to sit through it, and then at the end, say that he wants to still hang out with me. That my mess did not disqualify me. That was special. And um, that's what we try to do in Young Life, and I think that's what makes us all human you know, is that we're not all the picture that we put up. You know, we put the picture up, like even us showing up on Sundays, it's like we have this constant image management of what people want to see about what we actually put forward, and we just know that's not what makes us a great church. 
what makes us a great church is that we don't have it all together. That's what makes us an attractive place to be, is that we're not just a, you know, perfect people. It's like, no, we're broken people with a perfect Savior. And I think that the, the more that we can know each other's stories and love each other in the midst of those things is what makes us special. Um, and Jesus did that masterfully. Uh, and I feel like, um, you know, I would say over the years, like when I read the gospel accounts, Jesus' power is unparalleled. It's always impressive. I think that what has caught my eye recently is how he loves people specifically. Like he knows them and he loves them how they need to be loved. And um, I feel like that's just caught my eye in all different sorts of accounts. And so I'm going to do a short one because um, it's short, but it's also great. Uh, So this is um, uh, from Luke chapter 5. After this, Jesus went out and saw... Oh, actually, we're going to do a different one. (laughs) This is still Luke chapter 5. While Jesus was in one of the towns, a man came along who was covered with leprosy. When when he saw Jesus, he fell down with his face to the ground and begged him, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And immediately the leprosy left him. When I read that story, the first thing that jumps out at me is this incredible power that he has, that Jesus has to heal this man, okay, covered in leprosy. But what I feel like I could miss is the intentionality that Jesus has to reach out and touch him, and he touches him before he cures him. Could Jesus have, t- have uh, cured him without touching him? I would say absolutely. I think he chose to touch him. He chose to say, hey, I'm going to enter into your mess. Your mess doesn't disqualify you from my love. And so he reaches out and touches him. And this man, it says that he was covered in leprosy, meaning that it was well advanced, meaning how long has it been since he's felt the touch of another person? And maybe this touch that he feels from Jesus before he's cured would be even more impactful than being cured. And so he touches him and he says, I am willing. You are accepted. Be clean. And he's cured. Why does he touch him? Because he knows his story. I think about blind Bartimaeus, who's on the side of the road. There's a crowd following Jesus, and he's calling out, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus is walking, and the crowd says what? Quiet. Don't bother the teacher. Shut up, Bartimaeus. Just sit there. And Jesus stops the parade and says, hold on a second. Would you mind grabbing him? And and they go and get him and bring him, and Jesus heals him. Now, could Jesus have walked over there and healed his blindness? Absolutely. Why didn't he? Because he knows Bartimaeus' story, and he knows the rejection that he's felt, and he knows that having someone from the crowd who tells him to shut up, to have him go get him, will make an impact and will be a bigger healing. You see, he knows Bartimaeus' story, so he says, hey, let's stop the parade. Um, You, would you go grab Bartimaeus? I want to talk to him. Go get him for me. You see, he knows Bartimaeus' story, and I could honestly go through gospel account after gospel account, and when you read Jesus' interactions with stories, say, why did he do it that way? He healed this blind guy this way and this blind guy that way. Why? Because he knows their stories. He knows our story. He knew that I needed my young life leader two doors down. Um, He knows our story, okay? And when Jesus died on the cross for every single one of us, he died for you. I think sometimes, especially with young life, because we're telling kids all the time, we're in front of rooms, you know, for God so loved the world, I think it's easy for us to remember that Jesus died for the sins of mankind. I think it's easy to forget that he died for you. He knows your story, and he loves you. Um, I'm thankful for this church because I think that uh, they give opportunity for us to know each other's stories and um, for us to love each other in the midst of it. I remember we had been here um, maybe a year, and it was Janice's birthday, and it's my wife, and um, I had Young Life Club that Wednesday night, and... um, and I remember being like, and we were going to celebrate her birthday, you know, uh, that weekend, but it's just kind of a bummer. And it's just, 
kind of the reality of when you're in ministry that sometimes you got to be out on nights and you're like, oh man, I wish it didn't fall on my wife's birthday. And so I, we were still pretty new to town, but I called Jeremy Tolman and I called him and I said, hey, uh, it's Janice's birthday. I just, I told him the situation. I'm sorry I'm so weepy. I think it's dusty maybe. I, <laughs> I've, I have an injury or I don't know. I don't know. It's, it's been a long week. Uh, but I, just, I called Jeremy. I told him the situation. He said, don't worry about it. They went and took my family out for a picnic and got them cupcakes and sang happy birthday. They were Jesus to my family that day. But I almost didn't call Jeremy because I didn't want to be needy. And this is what I would say. The more that we can enter in to our need and admit the fact that we are needy people, we just are. And we can meet each other in that. We give, I give uh, the Tolmans an opportunity to love my family. And hopefully it blessed them. You know, I, I, th I think that the more we can come in grips with the fact that we are needy and we do need to be loved, with the confidence knowing that we ultimately are loved by Jesus, then then we have the freedom to say, hey, you know what, I'm not perfect, I have some needs, this is what's going on in my life. Um, I want to share the second half of something that happened to my dad and then I'll be done. When I uh, decided to work for Young Life, like, so my dad was always like, when is this Young Life phase going to end? Like, high school's fine, volunteering college, great. And I'm like, hey, I'm going to work full time for him. They're like, why? You know, so I'm like, this is, this is what I want to do. I'm, I love it. I'm good at it. I'm going to keep doing it. And he's like, okay, well, I better check it out. So he comes to a camp, okay? And uh, me and my buddy, uh, Josh Goodman, who a lot of you know, are doing like the goofy stuff up front. And um, for, this, for this fall weekend. And my dad is sitting in the back with my mom, watching me do this and be like, this is my son's living, awesome, you know? <laughs> and, uh, and then at the, uh, at the end of the club event, uh, the camp speaker comes on to share, you know, the gospel. And we end kind of throughout the weekend. Now, we have a saying in Young Life that we earn the right to be heard, meaning we uh, build relationships with kids and earn the right to be able to share truth with them before we just show up and share it. Who is the one person that could have stepped on that stage that earned the right with my dad? My neighbor. He was a camp speaker that weekend. And he walks out and he shares the gospel with my dad and the rest of the room. And my dad walks in, and at the, end of the, at the end of the weekend, we have something called the 20 minutes where we give kids an opportunity just to think about what they've heard. My dad comes back from the 20 minutes with tears coming down his face. And he gave his life to Jesus. After that weekend, my mom and my dad started to uh, go to church. And uh, that church was the group of people who cared for my dad's needs in his last couple months of his life. He died about four years ago. Of cancer and um, you know his body fell apart and honestly not everything changed when he gave his life to Christ it's not like the alcoholism was gone like that like it was a process um, but his faith grew as his body died and his needs were made real to a church body that cared for him I'm grateful to be a part of a body like that I'm grateful that I don't have to show up to church polished up every week ah. So thank you for listening. That's a little bit of my story. I hope that what you heard, though, is that God loves you and he knows you completely. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Will. That was incredible. Wow. God is good, isn't he? All the time, right? And we've got uh, everybody has a story. And we're a community, right, here to collect those stories. What would you do if Will was two, do two doors down from your house now, right? Are we a place that can receive Will as family? You know, when a child turns five, like we're turning five, your vision begins to change a little, doesn't it? I was thought about bringing a five-year-old up here, but I... Didn't trust myself. Um, but just, you know, a five-year-old, if you ask them, they're beginning to see the world outside. Things like kindergarten and T 
t-ball and all these things are beginning to emerge and be on the horizon because the foundation has been laid the 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 inner formation has been there and there's a certain time and place to begin to move towards your world and five is a good time for that and I want to just offer us just real briefly a challenge to say, Church One, we are turning five, and it is time maybe for us to begin to look outside, to begin to see and envision this world outside of us, and to ask, what can we do? How can we move towards this world? Will, you did a phenomenal job of just painting the picture of what it looks like when a life move towards, moves towards another life. And that's what we're all called to do. And that's what we're called to do individually, and it's also what we're called to do collectively. Let me just leave us with one little, last metaphor and one gentle challenge, and then we'll... Uh, go out and we'll eat and we'll have a great time. As I was reflecting on the church, I was thinking, you know, it's kind of like we've built this road. We've built kind of a five lane super highway. And those five lanes are our values, scripture, Sabbath, spiritual practices, service, spiritual friendship. These are the five lanes that when you come to this place, you get on those lanes and we're taking you to Jesus, right? We're, we're moving you from point A to point B and that's, it's a significant thing. It is a big deal to have a road built. A road opens up the way for things that never would have been there. But you know what a road needs once it's built, off ramps and on ramps. The next stage of the development of Church One is that we take this road that, and we're going to continue to have to always work on the road and maintain the road and, and build the road further out and all of that stuff. But for this road to thrive, for this road to be all that it needs to be, we need off ramps that connect us with the community around us, that allow us to get off and connect and engage. And we also need on-ramps, little places that bring people up on our road with us. We need to be, begin to build those little places, those little communities, those little side places that bring people onto the highway of Church One. We've done a great job of that, things like pubology and the ecclesia groups and Lori host and women discussions and um, prayers on the porch and Debbie Foreman and all the things that we're doing in outreach and Paul and the college Bible stuff, but all of these things, it takes a lot of on-ramps to bring people up. If I had a gentle challenge, and, it, and this comes from talking to people that engage this church, if I had a gentle challenge to all of us, is that we need to make it easier for, for people to feel connected here. Some of the feedback I get, and it's good feedback, they love the church, they love the field, they don't always know how to be connected. And the way that's going to work isn't just with some rock star performance up on this stage. The way people feel connected is that folks like you build on ramps for those people. I know I've told this story many times, but I'll say it one more time. You know, I, I sit out here and I preach and I, I look at the middle school kids and God bless them, I know they're trying their hardest to pay attention to me, but I think, man, I don't, I don't know if they're connecting. And Steve's song affirmed to me that they really weren't. They're not connected. <laughs> they're, they're kind of bored. And so I said, Steve, why don't you build an on-ramp for these kids? Why don't you take them, take them in the back, meet with them, play games with them, talk to them a little bit about Jesus. Make this more of their church. Don't just try to push them on the highway and hope they can keep up. Build an on-ramp. That's one small example, but if, if we, the more on-ramps that we build, the more we can connect people to the road that's built and the road takes them to Jesus, and it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. 
We've done a great job. There's tons to celebrate and, and all of that. And the road is built and on-ramps have been built. But I think there's more and more and more we can do. And so I just I want to encourage you to begin to think about that and pray about that. And, and five years from now, let's not only celebrate the road that's been built, but let's look at off-ramps and on-ramps and say, wow, look, there's an exit there and there's a stop there and there's a way to get on here. And what an amazing thing that God did. Well, I am grateful to um, serve here. I love this church. I love it. I love the teaching team. I'm so grateful to serve with every member on the team. I'm so grateful for all the overseers. I'm so grateful for all of you and all that you give every Sunday to make this work. And um, there's a lot to celebrate. And so let's continue in this spirit of celebration. We're going to go out in a minute and eat. But before we do that, uh, I thought the proper thing to do to close our time, as Paul so beautifully said, is um, this place wouldn't be without Ed DeYoung. Uh, I, it's the craziest thing that a church is started by a guy that doesn't even want to be up front. You know? And Ed, but that's Ed. He serves and he gives. He gives so we can get. And so I've asked Ed to come up and to give us a brief benediction and pray for us and dismiss us. So thank you, Ed. This will be quick. I've been in the back eating French fries. <clears throat> this is all that's left uh, that were hand cut this morning out on the grass by uh, Scott French. And uh, we, the, we couldn't get the fryer going. This is one of those story things. We couldn't get the fryer going. He's out here yesterday setting everything up, you know, da 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 And we get ready for go time out there, and we can't get the burners to kick on in the unit, in the Vulcan fryer. So I had Lisa Ballard and uh, Helen Holden come out, a couple of our intercessor prayer leaders, and we laid hands on the Vulcan fryer. And I'm here to report the fries are hot. <laughs> So a couple of remarks, and then we'll get out of here. A lot happens in five years, and uh, there's a lot of details. A lot goes on in five years, and at the same time, it goes by in a flash. And uh, I think both things are very true here at Church One. When we started, we had young kids that are now in high school. We had high school students that are now in college. We've had young couples starting out who now, now have families. Uh, Sean and Laura Smith be a great example of that. They're out there with their four beautiful kids this morning. And we've had um, uh, some Adults now retiring. So in a season of just five years, so much goes on. And Mike is always referring to seasons, so I want to thank you all for sharing this season, this five years with us here at Church One. Our desire as leadership is to help you in your discipleship, help you follow Christ, and to help you with your unbelief. And we're different today as a result of studying the scripture together, practicing the Sabbath, being here today, engaging in spiritual practices and friendships and serving one another. You are a community of blessing, Church One, uh, to me and to many others. I'd like to ask you to stand for our benediction. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he has lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment, to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. Father, we are grateful for your scripture and your word that guides us. And now as we go out uh, to break bread together, uh, we'll continue to pause to be grateful for what you have done and are doing for us in our church. In Christ's name we pray, amen.